here at Port Home with the scaffolding. Um, and also anyone who is joining us online, it's wonderful to have you with us and also a very warm welcome to any visitors who are joining us for the first time. Um, I just want to make you aware that today's service, it is a service of Holy Communion and there will be a retiring collection after the service for the Fund for Human Need. Now for anyone um, joining us online, there is an opportunity to give to this um, very worthwhile charity either via the Port Home bank account um, referencing Fund for Human Need or directly to the charity itself, details of which you'll find on the website. We're also in the season of Operation Ch uh, Christmas Child and shoe boxes, and you will see that we've started putting some shoe boxes in the foyer. So if anyone would like to take an empty shoe box home and start to fill it, then they are available. Um, National Collection Week is from the 15th of November. All I need to do now is hand over to our minister, Philip MacDonald, who is going to lead us in our worship this morning. Thank you. It's good to see you all this morning as we gather for worship. And as Sarah said, a special welcome also uh, to those who are joining us through the, through the live stream. Well, I've preached in uh, lots of different places, uh, both inside uh, and outside during the uh, years of my ministry, but I don't think I've ever preached from a building site before. So to have, uh, to have scaffolding behind me is a, uh, is a first for me, but it's good that the, uh, that the work is underway. Uh, we're sorry to hear that there's been yet another uh, delay with some of the, uh, some of the materials, a bit of a, um, a bit of a hitch there, but the work is, uh, is started and is ongoing, and we hope and pray that it will all be uh, completed uh, before too long, even if not quite as soon as we expected. But uh, even so, it's good that this uh, place is made available to us uh, by the uh, by the builders uh, so that we can carry on worshipping uh, on Sunday mornings as usual. We're grateful uh, for that. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for God's steadfast love endures forever. And we affirm that Jesus calls us here to meet him as we stand to sing together.
let us pray. Eternal God, creator of all things, giver of life, we praise and worship you. We thank you that you have always loved the world you have made, and that however far we stray from you, your love is always there to welcome us home. We do not deserve your love, but we dare to believe the good news of your mercy declared by our Lord Jesus Christ, whose offering of his life for us and for all people we set forth in this bread and wine. Be present at this your table, as with penitent and forgiving hearts we break bread and drink wine in your name. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that our worship may truly express our love for you and for one another. Make us glad and give us joy and peace. And so together, let us confess our sins. God, our Father, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. But you have kept faith with us. Have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. And restore us to newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To all who turn to him, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. We don't have any of our uh, children here this morning, but uh, even so, I will uh, share with you what I prepared to share uh, particularly uh, with them because it uh, fits in with the, uh, the theme of this morning's service. And I brought with me uh, this packet of seeds. Now, everybody does press seeds, so I thought that I'd do uh, something different. So these are uh, windowsill herbs, bouquet dip. So do any of you grow dill or perhaps put dill on your, uh, on, on your salads? Yes, one or, two, uh, one or two nodding heads. Well, here we have some uh, bouquet dill seeds. Now, I don't think it's even worth me getting, out, get, getting them out of the packet to show you because they are so very, very tiny. But um, that they are there, I can assure you. And I, I opened the packet uh, and I've split them up into about half a dozen uh, little envelopes so that had we had some children here, uh, I could have given each of them an envelope to, uh, to, to take home. But um, I just need a few volunteers to take home some, uh, some dill seeds this morning. So when you get them home, anybody who would like to take some, uh, what are you going to do with them? You're going to plant them, that's right. You're going to plant them. So first of all, uh, you'll need some, uh, some soil or ideally some, uh, some, some potting compost uh, so that you can plant them. Uh, and, and then what, they, what, what, they, what might they need uh, after you've planted them? Some water, yeah, some water. Anything else? Possibly some fertilizer, yeah, to make them, uh, to make them do a bit better, yeah. Some light, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So some heat, yeah, somewhere uh, where, where, where it's quite warm. So uh, water, light, fertilizer, uh, air, all kinds of things that the seeds will need, uh, and hopefully they, they will then grow. And we're going to be thinking today about growing, about growing our church, because uh, two weeks ago tomorrow, uh, Nigel and Bridget and I uh, went on the Leading Your Church into Growth uh, National uh, Annual Conference, and our service uh, is going to be based around that uh, this morning. So, as I say, I brought these seeds with me. Who'd like to take some uh, bouquet dill seeds home with them and see uh, see if you can grow them, see if you can get them to look like the uh, uh, the, the picture on the, uh, the the packet here? Okay, right, I'll come round.
So let us know how you get on. Maybe you can bring some uh, bouquet dill along to church in a few weeks' time and you can show us uh, how well it has grown. Right, we're going to sing, Spirit of God, unseen as the wind. Uh, growing is something that, that, that takes place, but, uh, you know, you, you can't actually see how it happens. You see the results of it, but you don't see just how it happens. Uh, and Jesus said it's like that with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is at work uh, all around us, uh, just like the wind blowing. And we see the results of the Spirit's work, but we don't actually uh, see the Spirit himself. And so we're going to sing, Spirit of God, unseen as the wind. Gentle as is the dark. Listen to our first Bible reading from St. John's Gospel. Reading from John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. The vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 
this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, two weeks ago tomorrow, uh, Bridget and Nigel and myself went to the Leading Your Church into Growth annual conference at uh, the Hayes Conference Centre in uh, at Swanwick in Derbyshire. And this came about because the, uh, the Yorkshire Synod of the uh, United Reformed Church uh, was recommending uh, that every church in the Synod uh, be represented at the conference uh, this year. I'm not sure how many uh, actually were, but uh, Ashley Evans, who is the, uh, the Synod evangelist, was one of the, uh, one of the leaders and speakers at the, uh, at the conference, and uh, church growth is something that uh, he is really, uh, really pushing uh, at the moment. So I wonder what you immediately think of if somebody says that they're going to talk about church growth. I guess that most of us think that it means more people coming to church, an increase in the size of our congregation, some new members. And if that's what you think about church growth, then you wouldn't be wrong. That's certainly part of it. And in a moment, Bridget is going to talk about numerical growth. But Leipzig, leading your church into growth, Leipzig emphasizes three areas of growth which are all linked and each of them has an impact on the others. And one of those areas is spiritual growth. So what do we mean by spiritual growth? The Lysig Handbook describes spiritual growth as people growing closer to Christ, or more people becoming more like Jesus. So do we want to grow spiritually? Do we want to grow closer to Christ? Do we want to become more like Jesus? There's a hymn in the Singing the Faith hymn book, which I don't know, but I've read the words, and it says this, More like you, Jesus, more like you. Fill my heart with your desire to make me more like you. That suggests that Jesus wants us to grow to be more like him. So how do we grow spiritually? And how do we bring about spiritual growth in the life of our church? When I did a harvest service for the uh, preschool group at Brayton a couple of weeks ago, I taught them a simple song which goes, Thank you, Lord, for this fine day right where we are. And then you add other verses such as, Thank you, Lord, for food to eat right where we are. Each of the verses ends with those words, right where we are. Spiritual growth takes place right where we are. Through meeting together, through worshipping together, through praying together, through sharing in Holy Communion together, we are in a place where we can grow spiritually, both individually and as a church community. But there are other ways of encouraging and enabling spiritual growth to occur. One of those ways is undoubtedly through prayer. And I'll be saying a bit more about prayer later. Another way is through Bible reading and Bible study. As some of you know, I'm currently running the disciple course. And starting a new disciple course got me thinking about some of the people who I've taken through that course over the past 20 or so years. People who would undoubtedly tell you that they grew spiritually as a result. And some went on to respond to new challenges and new opportunities for Christian service. It's interesting that some churches which are really thriving and growing insist that their members belong to a midweek group where they meet for prayer and Bible study. They might call it a cell group, they might call it a house group, doesn't matter what it's called. The important thing is that people are helped to grow spiritually through meeting together and encouraging each other. Not everybody can commit to something as intensive as the disciple course, but wouldn't it be good if more people joined our house group 
Or if the present house group had to split into two or three or four groups to accommodate more people. Of course, we can pray on our own, we can read the Bible on our own, and I'm sure we do that. But evidence suggests that growing churches are those where people meet together to do these things. Some of us who are parents will have had the experience of our children making friends who we perhaps didn't feel were particularly good role models for them. Or, on the other hand, making friends who we did feel were good role models for them. As Christians, Jesus is our role model. If we spend time with him, we will undoubtedly become more like him. We will grow spiritually. come to our church and our church family grows and we some get to know new people and we make new friends praying for numerical growth leading the church in the growth leading your church into growth conference said it wasn't something that we had to be embarrassed about or subtle about because it perhaps feels a bit um worn a bit in your face if we're praying for more numbers for more people to come to our church but in fact what we were told and encouraged to do is to be more intentional about it it's fine to ask for more people why shouldn't we ask for more people why do we want more people if we asked around the congregation today i think we would get lots of different answers but hopefully at the core of all of that is because we want people to have a love of Jesus, to get to know Jesus, to share that love of Jesus that many of us have here in the congregation today. So who may come? If we start to pray, who are these people that are going to come to our church? Some may be those with an existing faith, but think it's time for them to re-engage with the church and the life and worship. So others might think, I've never heard about this. Lots of people have talked about it to me over the years. I really don't know what it's about. I wouldn't mind going to a church and see if I can find out, just to learn more about whether this whole Jesus thing is something that's going to be right for me. Other people may have had a connection with this church or other churches through christenings, weddings, funerals, had a friend that came to church, maybe through a parent and toddler group, all sorts of different activities. And they suddenly thought, do you know what? After all of these years, all of a sudden, something is talking to me about going to church. I'm going to try a church. Some people might think, Port Home Church, I've heard that's a friendly church. Perhaps that's where I'll go. I'll just go and see what it's like there. Whether they actually can say it's because I want to develop a relationship with God or find out more about God, might not even, be, even think about it. But it perhaps might be somewhere where they want to make friends. And one of the quotes that we had in that uh, at the conference was, it's all very well being a friendly church, but well, actually lots of people come to church because they want to make friends. So it's nice to welcome people and can't give people a handshake, but a nice smile and things. But actually lots of people come to church because they want to make friends. And here at Port Home, I think we are good at making friends. And are we prepared to do that as more people come to our church? I think praying for numerical growth, and that is, will be part of the prayer that we're going to share later on, complements the ideas and the thoughts that we had on our vision day as we explore the growth and development of um, here at Port Home Church. So we've had uh, praying for spiritual growth, praying for numerical growth, and the last, the third one is praying for missional growth. Not a, not a word we use very regularly. I was very encouraged and uplifted at the conference by the number of people who think that now, right now, is a defining moment for church life, and they're enthused about reaching out to people in, in, in innovative ways, and of course, live streaming worship is one of those ways that we'll all be trying and also by 
traditional ways, but with new enthusiasm. And we had several instances of people saying, it really does work. We perhaps got so used to declining numbers in church in, I think, uh, almost all the years I've been in church life. At the heart, the idea that the church is missional, we are told, is that as a church community, we have a mission because Jesus had a mission when we follow him. Now, perhaps the idea of mission has not been one of those things that's caught on with us or not been high enough on our agenda and a word we don't use regularly. At conference, we recalled who we are how important we are to God, and as a consequence, how important everyone, other people, are to God. So two points stood out to me as far as missional is concerned. The first one is taking opportunities. Like the elderly lady who we told about, who didn't think of herself as missional, and she was one morning weeding the railings of the church when two people stopped to chat and we don't know what the conversation was but it finished with well I'm going to church I'm going to worship on Sunday morning at 10 would you like to join me and they did we were told that she was overjoyed and in, in fact two other people came to church in the same way I wonder how many people to whom we speak in this difficult world, world would respond to that invitation and the second was making opportunities because one or two things surprised me. I'm sure Philip will mention uh, one of them later on. That simple things that people have tried that have had a great effect. And we've had all kinds of activities in this church over the years. No doubt some will return. Others we may well decide should have lesser priority as we look to new ways of working. However, we were all reminded that we should not categorize things as sacred or fundraising or social or whatever that missional runs through all that things overlap how do we make opportunities for people to hear what we are and communicate who we are that they might give god a chance or give him a second chance to be in their lives meet him again in our vision day, we had lots of ideas, and some of those ideas are more practical than others. I think this conference came at an appropriate time because it gave us some ideas about where our priorities should lie. Leading your church into growth stresses the need to focus on just a few ideas, not tackle everything, and be determined to progress them. The question asked by one of the conference leaders was, if you're not leading your church into growth, where are you leading? And that keeps returning to me because it's not a, not a question we want to leave and let lie. Another contributor said to me, when the church is in mission, it is the true church. Well, we've all come this week and most of us, I guess, will come next week. Isn't that something, if we feel a need to do that, we ought to be telling others in any way we can. The hymn we're going to sing is based on the uh, words which uh, we heard uh, from St. John's Gospel, but it goes on to say, then we'll grow in your love and we'll go in your name that the world may surely know that you have power to heal and to save. You are the vine, we are the branches.
reading from Acts 17, verses 16 to 34. It's entitled, In Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you were ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. I'm sure that some of you will remember the uh, TV quiz programme, Blockbusters. Do you remember that? Hosted by uh, Bob Holmes. Uh, and you may remember that uh, teenagers had to uh, complete a path across a board by uh, answering a number of questions. And they could choose a question uh, knowing what letter the answer would begin with. And of course, being teenagers, there was always a great hilarity when a contestant said something like, I'll have a pee, please, Bob. On our Leading Your Church into Growth course, we had four P's. And these P's are intended to help us in growing our church. And we were told that this strategy has been used, uh, has been used fruitfully by lots of growing churches. The first P is prayer. I mentioned prayer when I was talking about spiritual growth. 
growth, whether spiritual or numerical or missional, needs to be rooted and grounded in prayer. Brother Roger of Teze said, when the church becomes a house of prayer, the people will come running. We were told at the Lycid conference that we should be intentional about praying for growth and that such prayer should be a priority in the life of the church. We were introduced to a particular prayer that we'll be saying together later in the service, and which I hope will become a regular feature in our worship here at Porto. If you're connected to a different church and you're joining us uh, online for this service, then you can equally well offer the same prayer for your own church. At the beginning of the reading from Acts chapter 17, which we've just heard, we're told that Paul was greatly distressed to see that the city of Athens was full of idols. In other translations, it says that he grew dissatisfied or that he was greatly upset. I wonder if we are dissatisfied or upset by the state of the church in our country today. The fact that so many congregations are in decline. So many are made up predominantly of elderly people who are growing tired and wondering how much longer they can carry on. Are we distressed or upset by the fact that our churches on the whole fail to attract new people? Paul's dissatisfaction and distress caused him to do something. It caused him to engage with the people in the city. Similarly, our distress and dissatisfaction should cause us to do something. It should cause us to start praying earnestly for church growth. Because unless what we do is rooted and grounded in prayer, then it won't be effective. Paul was bold in speaking about Jesus. And we'll be thinking more about that in a moment. But first and foremost, we need to be bold in our praying. We can pray alone, as I said earlier, but it's good to pray together. And I would commend our monthly port home prayers, where we'll certainly be making church growth a, fe a, a, a focus of our praying from now on. The second P is presence. It says in the Lysig handbook that there are three key gifts which we have to help us with presence. Firstly, we have our church buildings. I find it strange when I hear of people saying that they didn't know that this particular building was a church. But at the same time, just think how many people come into this church, at least when we've got a roof on and when we're operating normally. And hopefully we'll get back to that sometime soon. Because so many people come through our doors, we can be a real presence in the community. And that's true of so many churches which are used by the wider community. The second gift, the gift is that most churches have a history of being part of the community. And that's certainly been true of Porto. How many people have come to, uh, to this church uh, because of Pike, our parents and young children group, over the past 25 years or more? How many children have come to our holiday clubs? How many people have been to our coffee mornings? Again, it's true of many other churches as well. And the third key gift is what we sometimes call occasional offices. Uh, Nigel mentioned this, weddings, baptisms and funerals. We have a presence in the community and we need to think and pray about how we can develop that presence, how we can build relationships with those who we know uh, or, or people who have been to our church for one reason or another. And let's not forget our new neighbours who will be moving into the houses across the road very soon and amongst whom we must make our presence known. Paul made his presence felt in the synagogues and in the marketplace. He was intentional about engaging with people. Which brings us to our third P, which is 
proclamation. Proclamation is about presenting the good news of Jesus to those with whom we've already established a contact through our presence. We heard that Paul preached the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, we tend to think of preaching as the kind of thing that I'm doing now. And most of you would say, well, I'm not a preacher. But in the, but in the, uh, the Greek language, the same word means both preach and proclaim. So all Christians are called to preach in the sense of proclaiming or of telling the good news. So if we are wanting our church to grow, and if we are praying for our church to grow, then we need to consider how we can proclaim the good news. At the Lycid Conference, we were thinking about times of year when we could intentionally invite people to come to a church service, times such as Christmas or Easter, or whether we could put on some special kind of event to which we could invite people. Here at Port Home, our plans for the harvest weekend, when we were going to invite our new neighbours, were thwarted by uh, the roof. But it's not going to be like that forever. It may seem like it just now, but it will all come to, uh, to, come to an end, and very soon in the whole scheme of things. Well, in spite of what I've said, you might still think that proclamation sounds a bit like standing on the street corner and preaching. And you're saying to yourself, well, I could never do that. But surely any of us could invite a friend or a neighbour to come to a church service or a church event, perhaps one which has been planned and prepared with visitors in mind, so that when they come, they'll be helped to hear the Christian message. And you don't have to do the proclaiming yourself. Proclamation is the corporate responsibility of the whole church. But each of us can be a part of that. We can be a part of helping our church to grow through people hearing and receiving the good news of Jesus. The fourth P is persuasion. And persuasion is about helping people to understand that Christian discipleship can have meaning and relevance for them and at doing so in such a way that will bring about a response. As we heard, Paul used persuasion with those he met in Athens. He engaged with them. He debated with them. They talked together. They listened to each other. It sounds as though most may not have been persuaded by what Paul said, but some did. Some said, we want to hear you again. And the result was that some became believers. Luke mentioned Dionysius and Damaris and a number of others. There weren't hundreds, but there were some. And at the Lycid Conference, we were reminded that in planning for church growth, we're not necessarily talking about huge numbers of new converts, but a few new people is still growth conference we were given some ideas of things we could do in our church to help people understand what it means to be a Christian and to help them towards a place of commitment. The START course was recommended. That's a course which helps people to understand the basics of living the Christian life or some other kind of small group to which we invite people with the intention of helping them to become followers of Jesus. Yes, some of us might feel a bit uncomfortable with this idea of persuasion because we don't want to be seen as Bible bashers or we don't want to come across as though we have all the answers and everybody else is wrong. But surely we are here in church because we found something worth having. Our faith in Christ, our relationship with God, our belonging to the church gives meaning and purpose to our lives. We found something good, and if we found something good, then why not share it? I don't know if anyone saw uh, Scotland's Sacred Islands with uh, Ben Fogel. Uh, it was on uh, last Sunday, just at the time when uh, you would be in church. So maybe, uh, like me, you, uh, you watched it uh, later on catch-up. 
but uh, amongst the islands uh, Ben Fogel visited was Iona, and he was talking about uh, St. Columba and his uh, treacherous journey across the sea from Ireland in 563, when uh, Columba and his fellow monks uh, brought the, uh, the Christian faith to Iona, and then it spread to uh, other parts of Scotland and northern England. And Ben Fogel used the phrase, uh, with reference to, uh, to Columba, dream big or go home. Dream big or go home. And that's what we need to do when it comes to church growth. So let's dream big and let's resolve to pray and to work for the growth of our church. Amen. And so we are going to pray. And we're going to use the uh, prayer for growth, uh, which has been given to us by the uh, Leading Your Church into Growth movement. So we'll share this prayer together, and then uh, that will lead us into the other prayers that uh, we're going to say. So together, let us pray. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, Send your Holy Spirit to Fort Home Church to give vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions, joy to our worship, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we continue in prayer, when I say the words, living Lord, I invite you to say with me, hear our prayer. Living Lord, hear our prayer. As we pray for the growth of our church, we pray that we may grow spiritually, that we may grow closer to Christ and so become more like him. We pray that we may grow missionally, as we share the love of Christ in our community and beyond. And we pray that we may grow numerically as we invite others to our church and as we welcome them amongst us. We pray that you will give us a desire to see growth in all these areas and that you will help us each to play our part in bringing about this growth in our lives and in your church. Living Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for your church in every land. We rejoice with those Christians whose churches are growing and thriving, and we pray that we may be inspired by their stories. We weep with those who are persecuted for their faith. We pray that they may be strengthened and sustained, and that we may learn from their deep commitment and faithful witness in the face of adversity. We pray for churches which are struggling and whose mission has been hampered because of the pandemic or because their members have grown tired and weary. Grant them hope, strength and a vision for the future. Living Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation and ask that the church may continue to make a significant contribution to national life. May the church's voice be heard amongst the many voices speaking out in our land. And may the message of Jesus, a message of peace, love and reconciliation, be widely proclaimed. We pray for all who seek to bring about good, but who live their lives in fear because of times when evil seems to triumph. Particularly at this time, we pray for our MPs who fear for their safety following the stabbing of David Amos. We pray that they may be given courage to say and to do what they believe to be right. Living Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our world. As the COP26 climate summit gets nearer, we pray for those who will be taking part, that decisions which are made will be translated into action and that innocent victims of climate change in some of the world's poorest communities will benefit. 
We pray that we and all people will recognise our responsibility to care for the earth and its resources and to play our own part in bringing about necessary change. We pray for all in positions of leadership and responsibility in the nations of the world, that they may speak and act with wisdom and justice. Living Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all in need. We remember the family and friends of David Amos and all those whose loved ones have died as a result of the inhumane actions of others, that they may be comforted in their sorrow. Closer to home, we pray for Pam and her family following Peter's sudden death and for others whose loved ones have died suddenly or unexpectedly, that they too may be comforted and sustained. And in a time of quiet, we bring before God those for whom we particularly want to pray this morning. Living Lord, hear our prayer. Our prayers we offer in and through the name of Jesus, who gives life to all. Amen. And we share together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to share together in Holy Communion, we sing the hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us. Living Lord.
understanding for the uh, for the piece. And we're going to do what we did at the uh, the, the Lysig uh, conference. As you know, uh, we're being discouraged from uh, touching each other, shaking hands or hugging or anything uh, at, at the moment. Uh, so what we did at the Lysig conference is that we shared the piece by waving to each other. And we can include the people who are joining us uh, on, on, online, because uh, although uh, we can't see you, you can see us, so uh, you can share in this by, uh, by, by waving as well. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, also with you. and let us share the Lord's peace with each other with a wave. Please sing. As we gather at this table, we remember that Jesus was born of Mary. He lived our common life on earth. He suffered and died for us. On the third day, God raised him from the dead. And he is always present with us through the Holy Spirit. In his presence and in the company of all the people of God, past, present and to come, we celebrate the supper of the Lord. Listen. I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. <coughs> Here again the words of institution of this feast as they are given by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks We give thanks to you, O God, that from the earth you caused the grain to come for the making of bread, and that you caused the vine to yield fruit. We praise you for Christ, the bread of life and true vine, whose body was given for us and whose blood was poured out for us. By your Holy Spirit, sanctify us, and these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be the communion of the body of Christ, and the cup which we bless may be the communion of the blood of Christ. As we share the sufferings of Christ, so give us grace to know the power of his resurrection, that we may be made one and evermore abide in him, to your praise and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. When Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
faith in each gather, remembering that our Lord laid down his life for us. Jesus had given thanks, he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Strengthen for service, Lord, the hands that have taken holy things. May the ears that have heard your word be deaf to clamour and dispute. May the eyes that have seen your great love shine with the light of hope. May the tongues that have sung your praise also speak the truth. May the feet that have walked in your house ever walk in the light. May the bodies that have tasted your living body be restored to newness of life. Thanks be to God for his gift beyond words. Amen. We sing the hymn, Hear the Call of the Kingdom.
King of Heaven, we will answer the call. We will follow, bringing hope to the world, filled with passion, filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that this may truly be our prayer and that we may pray and work for the growth of your church. And may your blessing, the blessing of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon us and remain with us this day and always. Amen.